Even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down In Alabama, with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. One day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. And every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain. And the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is a faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith. We will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day. 
This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, My country tears of thee. Sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring. From the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire, let freedom ring. From the mighty mountains of New York, let freedom ring. From the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania, let freedom ring. From the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado, let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring and when this happens, when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, Thank God Almighty, we are free at last.
your mother.
President Wilson helped hired Mr. Templeton to work at his home, and Mr. Templeton was able to pursue a college degree where he earned his degree in 1828. Mr. Templeton became the fourth known African-American college graduate in the United States at that time. John Newton Templeton so believed in the value of education that he defied the law in Wheeling, West Virginia, at that time still part of Virginia, and taught African-Americans there to read and write. And for that, he was arrested. But that didn't stop him. He eventually settled in Pittsburgh and became the first teacher and principal of the first and only school designated for black children in the city. He paved the path for other people from underserved groups to receive a higher education. As Ohio University's 21st president, I intend to follow his lead. That's why, in my presidency, I've made the number one strategic pathway focus on diversity and inclusion, to focus on access to excellence, and with a commitment to first-generation students. When I think of John Newton Templeton, our first African-American graduate, I marvel at his bravery and perseverance. He sought an education at a time when blacks were not allowed to be educated and were prohibited by law, no less. He persevered, even though he was arrested, because he knew that education has the ability to unlock all possibilities. The late Nelson Mandela said, education is the great engine of personal development. It is through education that the daughter of a peasant can become a doctor, that the son of a mine worker can become the head of the mine, that a child of farm workers can become the president of a great nation. It is what we make of what we have. He said, education is the most powerful weapon which we can use to change the world. Good. Knowledge is power. Education is the true liberator. Today, universities and government buildings around the country are closed. Schools are not in session. But for this is not a day off. Together as a community and as a region, we must daily recommit ourselves to the mission of equality and the pursuit of freedom for all citizens. It is up to each of us to question the world around us and dream of a better day. It is what John Newton Templeton did. It is what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did. And it is what I encourage each of you do today and tomorrow and throughout your life. Thanks. As a special friend and somebody I respect at the highest level, let's welcome Dr. Jason Pina. I'm tropical. I'm not used to this cold weather. <laughs> Come on now. I'm with you. Shoveling snow. I came to Southeast Ohio for sunny days. I feel as though everyone in this room has a personal relationship with MLK Jr. The youngest and smallest among us may know him just as a name. Some of us know it just as a day off. Others lived during his time on earth. I believe in faith and fate and serendipity. I just moved in the rain and snow, and I'm unpacking dozens and dozens of boxes while I was by myself in a room. And I unwrapped this. Now this is a framed picture of a stamp. Now, many of y'all don't know what a stamp is. So there's these things called envelopes. I had to lick this one, it's not self-adhesive. <laughs> and it was 15 cents. You could mail a letter anywhere in the United States of America for 15 cents. So this stamp was issued on January 13th, 1979. Faith, fate, and serendipity. One of my best friends in the world gave this to me 19 years ago next month. After we had a trying experience during a Black History Month as a thank you. His legacy is that have kept me strong in weak moments. It's helped me have difficult conversations with colleagues and friends and my own children about how far we've come, how far we need to go, and how difficult the road may be. Walking arm in arm with you this morning gives me hope for the future. But I encourage you to take a moment 
Think about your relationship right, with Martin Luther King Jr. and university, the city of Athens, and this country. We are part of a larger legacy of the world, and I appreciate the fact that so many people in this community take that seriously. The men of Alpha Phi Alpha, and all those that had a small and large part to play in today's events. The mayor of my city. A lot of people like Christmas, and they like Halloween, or they like Easter, or my two favorite are Martin Luther King Day, today, and the International Street Fest, because to me, that means community. I reached out to my speechwriter, who happens to be six years old. <laughs> and she wrote me this. I have a dream. She included two clouds of what her dream was. No more two-hour delays. <laughs> the other one is no more bullies. Which was so impactful to me when I read this, when she came home all excited. No more racism. No more hate. No more prejudice. Martin Luther King strove and fought so hard for all the way up to that April day in Memphis when the shot rang out that meant the sky. I'm a white, middle-aged, middle-class male. I'm also the grandson of a Polish immigrant. Come in here for a better life. I am the great-great-grandson of an Irish immigrant. I'm also the great-great-great-grandson of an Algonquin Native American woman who traversed across the United States from New York to Oregon, again, looking for a better life for her and her families. My past is no different than your own. We are human beings. There's no place in my world, and hopefully there's no place in yours, for hatred. As a community, as a university, as a city, as people, we will all work together to embrace each other, to lift each other up, to support each other, and to find a better way for I've always been a professor who has an open door policy. As the mayor of this city, I still live by the open door policy. And if anybody feels like they're being wronged, anybody feels like there's fear in their neighborhood or in their living space, you can always reach out to the city, you can reach out to my office, and we will find a better way. Thank you. Up next, we will have a performance by Marvelous Dancers, founded in 2011 by students of Ohio University who all share a passion for the arts and appreciate its ability to move others. Though the night is black as my skin, there's a light burning bright showing me the way. But I know.
Kaleidoscope is a performing arts collective that was founded in 2014 by a group of multicultural women who saw the need to create a space where minority voices, stories, and talents can be showcased. Hello everyone, my name is Rajin Evans. Have things gotten worse in terms of race relations, or have they just been exposed? Jim Crow was done with years ago, except for today when you become a criminal, maintaining prisons to sustain their business, and humanizing my people in cages so lethal they don't even get a window. The internet is so powerful, yet so crippling. It helps bring awareness to every phenomenon that occurs in our world, especially in places that we cannot physically access. We are able to feel the blow just the same when we watch the videos on our phone. Everyone tweets about it, is outraged, and posts memes about it, and five days later, no one even speaks about it. If we want change, we need to actually be about it. The strength within our community is undeniable, but we are still broken. Not by slavery, not by Jim Crow, not by poverty, and not by an unjust judicial system, but by the blood of our own. Our black women still see each other as competition, and our black men are still evading their right to stand in powerful positions. And we haven't been uplifting and taking care of our children. We continue to perpetuate homophobia and racial contempt. And mental health is still considered to be taboo, as if saying a prayer will make it exempt. In the words of the great Lauren Hill, how are we to win when we are not right within? This fight didn't just end because we got a black president in office. That term is long gone. There is still work to be done. We don't need hashtagging Twitter activists. We need leaders, we need doers, we need fighters, and we need brave hearts to continue the legacy. This is no longer a war between love and hate, but between greed and power. We need intellectuals to figure out solutions and to strategize. And we need our artists to express the pain that everyone is feeling, but can't bring to fruition. We need new protectors similar to that of the Black Panther Party, to look out for their people and keep us safe, because this world is dangerous. We can't even walk down the street without the fear of being murdered. Our circumstances have not changed. We need to continue to pursue justice. There are people in high positions trying to take away our freedom, trying to instill fear in us again, and trying to break us down. They have your destiny in the palm of our hand. Are you going to fight for it? My art is just a tool that inspires our generation and archives our times, but you all are the law changers and history makers. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. The responsibility is a lot and the burden is heavy, but we need to finally assume our roles as the new generation in the face of change. We are no longer the future. We are the present. Thank you. Hey, it's too great a burden to bear. Dr. Ty Douglas is an associate professor of the University of Missouri and lead pastor of the Salt City Church. His research explores the intersection between identity, leadership, and education with an emphasis on black masculinity, spirituality, and community-based spaces like barbershops, churches, and sports events. The author of the award-winning book, Border Crossing Brothers, Black Males Navigating Race, Place, and Complex Space, and the recipient of an NAACP Innovations and in Research and Practice grant to study black male student athletes, Dr. Douglas's work has also appeared in outlets such as the Urban Review, Educational Studies, Teachers College Record, and Race, Ethnicity, and Education. He is a committed husband, father, leader, and international speaker who is living a life of purpose and inspiring others to do the same. Dr. Tyrod Douglas. Of my soul. This battle looks lost. I'm constantly falling beneath my cross. Now I fought the good fight of faith till I was told this battle is not. Yours, God is still in control. I had to learn to let him fight in my place. He didn't slow me down. He quickened my pace. And for that, I will talk, I will still strive. 
In his word I will abide. I won't faint, I will stand strong. Even if I stand alone. And if someday I may fall, I'll just look back and recall. When I was down in this fight, my God led me to the land. Listen. So I fell one time, and I may fall again. But the important part is that we're gonna win. The remedy for this battle is not up to you. Just put your trust in the Lord, and He will see you through. I have a lot of respect for Alphas. I have lots of friends. In fact, the, the, the leader of my country in Bermuda is actually an Alpha. Who we know and probably understand at the end of this talk that I'm, I'm passionate about our sisters as well. I'm happily married. Just before I came here, I had a quick conversation with my bride and my youngest, Joan the side in March. And I was just some inconspicuous guy in a gray suit. And she held my hand, turned around. I was actually between a beautiful, Brown lady and an aunt on my left who's a white female. I said to Anne, I said, Anne, are you going to abandon me now or are we going to walk together two by two? And she's like, no, I'm not going to abandon you. Let's do it. So we walk together, we held hands, and she, she said, thank you for the love. And your gloves. I appreciate you. <laughs> Every single time I pass through the Atlanta airport, there's a, a King Memorial there. It's a glass area. It has a, a, a gray suit jacket that's about the color of mine. It's a little small in stature. It reminds me that King probably wasn't, he actually wasn't that tall. He didn't wear glasses, but he wore them occasionally to sort of look intelligent. Isn't that it? <laughs> he actually had insecurities. He had challenges. He was a short, dark skinned man in the 60s. <laughs> now, I was born in the late 70s, but dark skin wasn't in when I was coming through either. He may have wrestled with self esteem. That it's necessary for us to become a student of his life, not just his speeches. And the speeches are deep. My nine year old, he has an audio recording of, of Dr. King, and so we're going to drive in the car, we're playing it over and over. This was like, once again, we're going to play it again? The, the booming bass rings out five score years ago. A great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. He begins to give us historical context in the speech. It sounds like some 50, 60, 70 year old. He goes to the Baptist preacher voice. In about three months' time, I will be the exact age that King was when he died. I'm, I'm pretty young, right? <laughs> At 39 years old, he, he had lived a life that I would describe as obituary worthy. I mean, it's a little bit humbling when you begin to think about the journey of people. I want to encourage you today to begin to reverse engineer his life. So if he was dead at 39, what was he doing at 19? What was he doing at eight? Every single time he left home, it was possible that could be the last time that he saw his family. Think about his kids, who had probably learned more about him in death than they knew in life. Have you ever seen his parents? Like, like his parents gave him to us. Challenge us to, to live what I call an obituary worthy life. Uh, when President Obama was running for office, there was a picture of Dr. King and a picture of then candidate Obama, and it said, for Dr. King, I have a dream. Under President Obama, it said, I am the dream. Uh -huh. There's a generation of people who believe that the dream was about a president or one person. It's not just about individuals, but it's also about institutions. He wasn't just trying to inspire uh, a generation to, to elect one president, but his dream was about each, and, each of us in this room. Do you realize that? Let's have a slightly different accent. Did anyone notice? Yeah. Do you hear a slight little British twang? Yeah. Has anyone ever heard the island of Bermuda before? How about besides the Bermuda Shorts, come on. Yeah. And the Bermuda Triangle, what else do you really do, right? I right. think Bermuda is on this map. Where is it? Off the coast of Virginia. It's about 600 nautical miles off the coast of North Carolina. A mile and a half wide at its widest point. You can look out and you can see the beauty of, of, of infinity as you look at the skyline. It's a beautiful place to be born and raised. It's not very often, I believe, that you have mayors and students and provosts and presidents and community members all in one space. And this is the moment of destiny. Back to my journey in Bermuda, I recognized why I was born. Like, have you found that which you were born to do? And if you really want to live an obituary worthy life, have you found that which you're willing to die? <laughs> There's some of you here in this room, and you're going to mundane jobs every single day, and you're dying. I want to challenge you. 
2018, beginning of this year, I want to challenge you to find that ritual of who wants to do what you love. Do what you love. Love what you do. Love what you do. Do what you know. Do what you know. And you'll know what to do. And you'll know what to do. Okay. And the things that you're called to do on a global level, you've already done on a smaller level. We're at the University of Missouri. A place that has been on the news for racial tensions and uprisings that, for quite frankly, I'm proud of our students and the work of our campus to actually talk about things that are not just about Mizzou, but are national and international. Even in my country of Bermuda, a country where 60% of the population is black and 40% of the population is white, our prisons are over 98% full of black males. In Bermuda. Paradise. Not Baltimore, not Botswana, Bermuda. Colonialism and, and white supremacy and patriarchy and the systems that have been uh, manifested all across this globe for our administrators and our students. I want you to begin to open your eyes, to, to walk around this, this campus and to begin to see perhaps what you have not been able to see previously. George Orwell says, to see what's in front of your nerves takes constant effort. The NCAA study that I engaged in took place right around the same time that the brothers uh, stood up and, and were willing to uh, boycott and not play the game. As the president of our university system was resigning, I was teaching about the system of oppression. These images, of course, are parallel to images of people like Jeremy Macklin, who I think plays for the Baltimore Ravens now, and other people, other student athletes, demonstrating athletic prowess. But for me, as an educator, as someone who studies curriculum, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, but this is bulletin board material, this is curriculum. Like, does anybody else see what I see? Why is this the case? 52 black male student athletes, and part of the beginning of our study was we just walked around the building and we came to this wall. Now, why is it that there were no black or brown faces on this athletic, uh, academic or American board? This imagery reinforces problematic stereotypes that you're not quite human. The systems that function around us sometimes impact how our stories are told, who gets to tell the stories, and how we even understand our own stories. We are one race. I recognize when I do my own research, and I would encourage you to take a look at a film called Race to Power at an Illusion. There are policies that were put in place that undermine black and brown neighborhoods. You may have a house now, for example, in Detroit, that's in one side of the tracks and it's worth $60,000. And a house in another neighborhood, because of the policies now, that house is worth you know, half a million. The property has been very, very significant, not just in uh, ownership and economics, but also in access and opportunity. The end point of one generation is the beginning point of another generation where we account for the oppression of our past. And last week I was at an MLK event in my city, uh, an official who was really proud to get up and tell the story of how they had put up a plaque to commemorate the, that there was an atrocity that had taken place racially on that, in that particular location. They were trying to build the highway, instead of them putting it through the, the, the neighborhood that it should have gone through based on the natural trajectory of the road, there was a sharp turn and they took you through a black neighborhood, demolished all the black businesses, you know, undermined the economic infrastructure of the entire community. And the general was quite proud to highlight the reality that they had put a plaque up to commemorate. Like we're past the point of plaques, plaques are insufficient. Disinvestment and the, and the undermining of communities that now are generational. I don't want you to get angry at systems today. We're too sophisticated to need to use inappropriate language to describe people. We don't go around using the N-word anymore. But we have systems that hate. We have systems that are violent. We have systems that undermine consistently and intentionally. Most of my classes, I utilize this monopoly exercise. And of course, there are students who always resist it. They always feel like, well, listen, man, I mean, but what about those who can pull up themselves up by the bootstraps? And you well, but some people don't have boots. And then what usually crystallizes the experience is the monopoly game when we start, I'm playing some music, I've got happy play, happy year. Three people, they start, they're going around the board, and life is good. They're just buying all the property, a good old time. They're picking up boardwalk and railways, and everything is good. <laughs> And now there are new rules, because I'm running the game. Like, well, uh, now the two or three people who are left out, they come in, they get to take all the property of the people who were there originally. And all of a sudden, the tenor of the game changes. And the people who were there playing first start to look at the people who came and took their stuff some kind of way, like, oh. <laughs> and then they continue playing, which is competition. And now most of the property is getting, getting bought up. And the folks who have been disenfranchised and try to catch up, and it's very tough once you've already been undermined by a system. Mm -hmm. 
But there's still one more group that's not in the, in the game yet. Usually, if I can do it right, I try to have my most existing students in that group. If I the nails, let's look at disinterested. Most of the property is going like Baltic Avenue is all that's left. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the game now! And you can imagine what happens. They're landing on people's property. They're frustrated. They, they begin to say things that they probably never said before. Like, man, I am so tired of being on your property. I wish I was in jail. Jail is easy to be on this board. Because at least in jail you get three square meals, right? And so for the first time in this game, students will begin to ask different questions. Like, yo, this is not fair. And of course, you know the way it's the game. The people in the game are usually group two, the group that came and got to steal the property. You know, the Native Americans were here first, and most of the rest of us were all immigrants. They're frustrated because, okay, cool, this is a game for class, but what if your final grade was based on your experience and now your outcome in this game? This is the final assignment, and however you made up, you can't age, well, that probably is see. Then what if I decided that your grade would be the grade for your children 25 years from now when they're in my class and I'm now I'm a 60-year-old professor? Mm -hmm. If Sue got a C on this final grade, then little Sue Jr., when she comes to my class, she starts with a C. Wouldn't that be problematic? If I did that, but also didn't tell the full story. So Sue comes into the class, and Sue's like, J Sue Jr., well, why, why, don't I, why do I have to stop for seeing? Mama Sue just didn't work hard. Mama Sue could have put herself up by her bootstraps like pretty much, and you get the metaphor, don't you? That the end point of one generation is the beginning point of another, and when we start to tell problematic, dishonest stories, it also does something for next generations that what we see in front of us is not necessarily just based on happenstance. Right. That the system of structures that Dr. King talked about, you have good intentions, you don't want to see people hurt. But the way our society is set up, it's very difficult to empathize with those who we don't understand, whose histories we have not really been told. Today is about beginning to do what I call research. Research is cool. Yeah, ten years, you're early. That was a, that was great. I was spending most of my time in the community, so I can't really quite explain how that happened. King was a man of faith, but I'm gonna tell you mine. I pray over my stuff. I'm saying you're in a master's program, a PhD program, or an administrative position, and you feel like I'm not equipped. Research asks us to be honest. Research says, why is Dr. Ty Douglas? What's the stories that that allow me to get here? Research challenges me to do that. You can also do what I call research, free search. Hey, this is a game changing paradigm. Because I believe that there are many leaders and administrators who've never done research. Jobs and positions that the credentials have prepared them for, but the heart's not ready for it. Say that again. Your heart's not ready for it. If you cannot empathize with people, if you're not willing to hear their story, the story of police brutality that King told in his speech. This is not new, we just got cameras now. Yeah. How did I end up here? A, a skinny, dark skinned boy from Bermuda. British influence and socks and the shorts. <laughs> but my mom was preparing me for something. I was always preparing to graduate. That was nursery school, Miss Tucker. At Patrick Primary School, I, I was blessed to have a teacher like Miss Furman who, in grade two, she affirmed me in words. She let me realize that words were powerful. My dad asked me the other night, he said, man, when did you start speaking? I was like, I can't really tell you, man. I've probably been talking all my life. But at school, I always got in trouble for talking. Love for them. You know why they love basketball? When they love their class, because their class is sitting behind somebody's head on the basketball court. They kids love to be affirmed for the creativity that we affirm in a basketball context or in music. But in our classrooms, even in our classrooms at our universities, this is game-changing work. No one else in the world has done it. I've done a study of black males in Bermuda, a study of black males at the University of Missouri. In 2008, we've had a number of men who've been killed, and all of them, save one, has been black. Because the perpetrators have been black as well. But one of the guys in my study who in the newspaper with a knife in his hand at a soccer game, and he basically told me when I interviewed him, he said, I wasn't in the game. Somebody was fighting my brother, and I was trying to protect my brother, like my biological brother. He said, man, one of the things I realized when I went to prison, that was the very first time I could just stop and reflect. And he also talked about how he was in the gumbays, and how the gumbays are this African dance troupe. That when he did it, he said, all oh, his body motions, he just feels like water, and he says he has the opportunity to just flow. 
He said, we're the places where our kids can just flow and just stop outside of prison and outside of the athletic fields. So I'm talking to Ms. Purvis' class. I'm floating. And Ms. Purvis like, listen, Tyrone, you need to stop talking. You need to be quiet. I love Ms. Purvis. But on this particular day, I'm at a reputation up here. <laughs> I put my blazer in the British, right? So, and I stood up in front of the class. I had some of the girls in the class. I'm trying to impress, too. I said, well, Ms. Furman, you know, with all due respect, I think you're being a bit facetious. <laughs> Ms. Furman was wise. And instead of giving me a detention, she said, do you know what that means? <laughs> now, what Ms. Furman didn't know was my mom had bought me a book for 365 days of the year and every single word in the book. For, for each day. Procedures! <laughs> but I knew how to use it, use the contact, so I was ready for it. So, well, I tried to fix my pockets here when I said it. Well, Mr. Furman, actually, uh, facetious means trying to be funny but really not respecting others. She was impressed. And some of you are impressed because you didn't even know what facetious means. Okay, well, how do you spell it? F A C E T I O U S. She was impressed. She didn't give me any type of punishment. What she did was she affirmed me. She said, wow, that's an accident. Now shut your mouth and be quiet and sit down. Okay, I learned that words can get me out of trouble. I realized that there's a connection between my mom's advocacy and trying to get me to read a book and the fact that this could get me out of trouble. I'm like, okay, well, that's what I can work with that. And I became this, this kid who was affirmed. You're likable and capable. You're beautiful. You're amazing. You're talented. I was advocating for my friends when, when we need to write a letter to see whether we could get you know, some actual play time. I, I realized that writing proposals was actually something that could change things. So I would write a letter like, we're finishing our work a little bit early today. And on behalf of the young man of primary six, <laughs> I'm writing to advocate for, our, and for an opportunity to have an extra bit of sport. <laughs> and I thank you in advance for your consideration. <laughs> she loved it. We got a chance to go play. I'm the hero, and I realized again, proposals is something that could also bring about well some change. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And even to this day, I'm still writing proposals. We just got a $100,000 donation for, towards the Salt Center. They started young. We're supposed to look back. And don't worry about the folks who, like my high school guidance counselor, may not see what Ms. Ferbert saw. Because in high school, it was a challenge. I was taking classes like Latin, except I wanted to be a doctor. So I was taking biology, chemistry, physics, and Latin, and I was struggling. And it was tough being dark skinned. I didn't feel great. I went to school depressed. When I came here one day, my mom, she's an amazing person. I was taking the Atlanta O level and I met her at the door. And she asked me, how did the O level go? I'm like, well, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. And she said something that really inspired me. She said, did you do your best? Because I had done my best, but I knew it was going to be a real tough road as far as passing. And I guess maybe that's what my guidance counselor was referring to when she wrote a letter of recommendation for me that Tyrone Douglas is an average student who is an advocate. Please, if you understand me, write letters of recommendation. Tell the student maybe they should find somebody else to write one for you. Don't write a letter like that. Yeah. Here's something to help somebody who's applying for grad school. I, I needed two letters of recommendation. I asked three people to write them. That's, that, that's, that should help somebody. All right? Somebody may, they may forget, or whatever. So I had options. Options are beautiful. And I felt impressed not to use my high school guidance counselor's letter. And so what happened was, I just decided, let me open up and see what she thinks about me, and I read those lines. Tyrone Douglas is an average student of average academic ability. I was infuriated. I was inspired, but infuriated. I was discouraged, but I was still determined to prove her wrong. And it was really cool in 2016 when I was releasing my book, and it was all across the news in Bermuda, and you know, people were excited that I got a chance to go back. The first part I went on my speaking tour in Bermuda was to that school. To talk to supposedly average students. Race, prejudice, plus social and institutional power. We're moving past the pejorative remarks. We have to begin to ask some different questions of systems. But if you go to a pond and you see one or two fish do the backstroke, they're dead. You ask questions of the fish. I mean, maybe they had some bad food. But when you go and now you see, 50% of the porn is doing a backstroke. You can no longer ask questions of the fish. You must now ask questions of the... Uh -huh. My grandfather's eyes looked like this. I didn't have a great relationship with it. The system 
that would suggest that a young dark man like him could not go to the early black academic high school in Bermuda because his parents were not married when he was born. And so he couldn't go to this particular school because he was not deemed legitimate, and that broke him. And as a result, he didn't have a great relationship with me. And I didn't like it. I didn't understand why this dark-skinned man would drink himself pale sometimes. He was getting sick at one point. My mom said, I think you should go in and visit your grandfather and have a conversation with him because things are not looking so well. So I did, and he began to tell me some stories, and he began to shift my mindset. I began to reflect on his journey. I began to develop empathy for this man who could not pursue his goals and dreams to be a doctor. But for him, every house that he built, every edifice that he designed was still a reminder that he couldn't do what he always wanted to do. These systems destroy our families and our communities. That we need to find a way, Athens, to touch these townies. Like there are kids who, if you don't reach them, they're not going to get here. And I know that. I know that from my own experience. I'm working with young people who the first time my university hears about them is on a clearing report because there's been some type of robbery. And I'm like, but I've been working with them trying to get them to come to our campus. They serve you burritos and moes. He wants a bachelor's degree. How can you reach them, Athens? My grandfather needed an advocate like that. I said, your eyes are yellow. Your eyes are banana yellow. He said, I have not looked in my eyes in years. How is it that you can wash your face every single day? How is it you can brush your teeth? How is it that you can go to the mirror and not see your eyes? We're teachers, we're administrators, and we, we haven't looked into our eyes. We haven't asked the questions, we haven't faced the doubts and the, the, the fears and the, the concerns that keep us up at night, but we smile by day as if everything's good. And what I've realized is we need to begin to be honest. Everybody's going to believe in you, Dr. King. Now everybody's going to believe in your dream. I tell you, he was human. He struggled with some stuff. It wasn't easy for Karate and the kids. It was a challenge. We, we do the disservice if we just talk about a speech and a march and go home. We need to ask some tough questions of ourselves today. What's your core message? What's your research? What's your research? But I need you to do some me search so then you can do free search. So you can get free. Nice. What I realize is at my university, listen, when the cameras come and everybody's there and CNN shows up and they ask the question, what are systems of oppression? That's not the time to have to go and do a Google search. Right. You've got to understand that thing from, a, uh, from a, uh, an authentic perspective. And that's what will allow you to do what I call not just leadership, but when you do free search and leadership, you do what I call freership. We need some folks that will set the captives free, that will go to communities and build bridges between those who don't have and those who do. Even if folks don't believe Dr. King, even if they question whether you should even use that portion of the speech. That's right. The speech that we've all come to know and love, the, the I Have a Dream speech. If you study that speech, Dr. King is standing at a podium, and for the first 12 minutes, he's reading from a manuscript. And it's powerful, it's eloquent. You've heard it, it's a history lesson. He talks about the five school years. Then he talks about about 100 years later. And he talks about the unresolved complexity of the current situation. He talks about the, the unfulfilled promises of a nation that has not fulfilled what they said they would do. He talks though about resolve. We will not, or we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. And he talks also about the fierce urgency of now. He talks about the reality that we need to move towards a, a, a period, a future where the, the Negro's legitimate discontent has to be acknowledged. He also challenges us to not allow bitterness to destroy our capacity to love everybody, including those who look differently from us or believe differently from us. He challenged us. He said, go forward, don't settle. He said, we cannot turn back multiple times. We can never be satisfied, he says. He says, suffering may come, tribulations may come. He says, but we and I still have a dream. And it's a dream that's deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream. I have a dream today that one day. But the real power for me in that story is that Dr. King was not even sure whether to include that portion of the speech in his speech. Did you know that? He was reading for the first 12 minutes of his prepared message with his speech writer. And the folks the night before said, hey, Dr. Man, leave that out. You've already said that stuff before. But you know what happened at 12 minutes? 
this little lady behind him called Mahalia Jackson. Yes, wow. Yes. <laughs> Who said, tell him about the dream, Martin. That's right. That's right. Tell him about the dream. Yes, sir. And it was at that point that the Baptist preacher came out and he forsook his notes, notes, and he had to speak extemporaneously about a dream that he knew would be fulfilled in words like this. Right. And he had to tell him about the dream. Yes, sir. Why is that important? Because each of us have moments where we question if we're good enough. Mr. President, Lady Provost, like you have no but you don't need people around you who can tell you about the dream that this place is amazing, that Ohio University is the best university out there, that you were actually here before OSU. Let them know. Let them know. Walk in that swag that this is a place where we're going to not just talk about diversity, but how we take care of our kids that are here. We're going to make sure that we are the first and best. Tell them about the dream. And I close with this. You're looking at a miracle. It's not just about Dr. King. I came all this way. I braved the, the, icy, the icy words to get here today because I need to challenge you at this place. That research, that research, that free search uh -huh. is personal to me. Oh, you see, right here, you're looking at a miracle. And I am inspired every time I reflect on Dr. King and his movement and, 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 and what he did because I recognize that movement and moments are the difference between life and death. You see that amazing mom that I told you about? Before she helped to inspire me to be all that I was to be, and I have an amazing dad who took me in as his own when I was about two, no, adopted me at about six. My biological father, I didn't know him, so twice in my life, really. The third time, I was going to my hands to his in a casket and talk about the dream and come in full circle. And you'll be interested to know that my biological father is from, wait for it, St. Louis. Whoa. Whoa. Amen. So I called you, son, for such a time as this to come with your little British accent and to be a professor at the flagship institution of your father's state where your ancestors are laid in graves.